Um, morning, everyone. Um, I hope uh, everyone's able to see and hear me uh, okay. Um, my name is Anthony, I'm uh, based out of London, and I'm really here for this, this plenary session, evening, uh, India's transformation. Um, before I introduce uh, our uh, impressive lineup of people. If you allow me a few brief words uh, to set the scene, uh, both at a, a, a geopolitical uh, as well as an economic level, the context is a, is a busy one uh, and a fragile one with far reaching uh, implications. The recent deadly clashes. Uh, on the Himalayan border, second uh, sovereign credit rating cut of the month last week, uh, and a recent surge in, in coronavirus infections, to name just a few things. Uh, there has been criticism, especially from business, of the government's economic rescue response, uh, big on boosting company credit, falling short, it seems, uh, on new public spending, on tax breaks, on cash support uh, to revive uh, demand. That at least seems to be the consensus. Not enough to prevent uh, a contraction of at least 5% in fiscal 2021, says Goldman Sachs. Now, this discussion centers on the extent to which the drive to modernize India has suffered, uh, has been altered, has changed uh, course as a result of the pandemic and how to get it back uh, on track. Of course, uh, an important question would be um, just how on track uh, things were uh, before the outbreak began. Q1 growth numbers show uh, economic activity clearly slowing before COVID-19 hit and a, a contraction in, in investment pre the pandemic uh, also uh, apparent. Um, it's a, a refrain we're hearing from many corners of the globe that the pandemic has created a window of opportunity for a reset. In fact, I heard an, a couple of our speakers say this uh, over the last few weeks, a window in which to change uh, mindset to adapt corporate cultures, to leverage new technology, to restructure global supply chains, to test new ideas in a new context. A window, perhaps, to achieve the self-reliance that uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, has, has striven for. Um, lots to talk about. Enough from me. Let's get straight to our panel. I want to introduce them now. Ashish Chauhan, Chief Executive of the Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, Sanjay Kiloska, Chairman of Kiloska Brothers and, and President of uh, IMA India. Rekha Menon, Chairman and Senior Managing Director of Accenture India. And Nessa Mundia, Chairman of Development Credit Bank. Uh, my thanks to uh, all of you uh, for joining and uh, my apologies again uh, for joining a little bit late this morning. Um, uh, Ashish, what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you each an opportunity to lay out your opening position, uh, if you like, and then begin a discussion from the back of that. But I will throw you a question um, uh, in order for you to do that. And, and um, Ashish, let me let me start with you. Uh, Prime Minister Modi, as I mentioned, has talked about a, a self-reliant India. Do, do, do Indian businesses... Um, have that mindset, that culture, which can lead to the sort of innovation, the sort of cost effectiveness that is so desperately required now? Yeah, I think so. Uh, in a way, uh, uh, self-reliant doesn't mean you produce everything here in India. Uh, and for me, uh, in a way, uh, Indian uh, industry has proved beyond doubt that it's able to uh, handle newer challenges. So uh, I don't think there is an uh, issue in terms of the Indian industry not being capable of doing it. It's the other way around. That is how the Indian state uh, actually responds because the amount of uh, bureaucratic hurdles which people need to go. So what we need to do basically uh, from the government side is to have uh, immediate work on land reform, labor reforms, judicial reforms, administrative reforms, tax reforms. If we do this fast, I think Indian industry will respond. And it's not that only the Indian industry will come in, but the rest of the world will also come in to manufacture in India. So for me, uh, we uh, from the government side also, uh, there is to be uh, some sort of a, a walking few steps uh, forward to attract uh, the industry. And I think many states, because many of these are actually state subjects, and now uh, many states are competing with each other to uh, get a lot of uh, newer industries uh, in, I mean, attracted to them. So for me, uh, I think it's an opportune time, as you said. Okay, just a, a quick follow-up on that. Um, what economic packages and relief me measures are most Indian businesses expecting from here now to help them? 
the way uh, what has been announced is uh, basically two parts one is uh, on uh, to take care of the poor in terms of food uh, in terms of their basic needs uh, and little bit of money in their hand then the smes uh, and the vendors the street side vendors uh, and then uh, the large uh, companies including moratoriums and things like that but what has happened over last 30 years uh, post the first uh, sort of swing of liberalization uh, we were waiting for many other liberalization uh, measures uh, that were not coming because each government was thinking that uh, whether we are liberalizing too much and what will happen to the social uh, sort of uh, stability i think uh, post covid uh, what has been announced and not been discussed is actually huge amount of uh, reforms that have been announced which all of us have been waiting for last 25 30 years so effectively what is not discussed is what the industry has been waiting for and uh, what we keep on discussing almost uh, 21 lakh crore of uh, uh, the relief package uh, is of course there it's required but more importantly for industry to come stay feel welcome uh, work without any trouble on a day to day basis is where the reforms which have been announced if you can take up uh, on that Uh, i think we will do a good job of attracting the uh, investments and okay uh, things uh, basically uh, of course we need to uh, invite uh, the uh, manufacturing from other countries like china yeah. but two things we have done very well uh, one is in uh, the bpo sector uh, i think uh, that we have an expert here uh, software and bpo uh, despite lockdown of 70 75 days Uh, we have pretty much run the world sitting here in india in lockdown from homes and i think uh, somebody was saying before this uh, working from anywhere and so india has proved beyond doubt that in the areas which it is very good at almost 200 billion dollars uh, of revenues it's doing well and second is pharmaceuticals it has provided a lot of medicines to rest the world so these two things we need to build up uh, later on probably if time permits we can talk on that Okay, very good. Uh, Ashish, thank you very much. Uh, Rekha, let me let me bring you in here. A general question to start with. With that in mind, what we've just heard, what what do you think should be done to get this growth story back on track to in, to ensure this transformation stays on track? Okay, and uh, first, uh, uh, thank you for referring. We are just going to refer to the technology industry, the IT and ITES industry, and that's right. We're a one ninety billion export uh, led industry, and Uh, we responded fairly agilely and quickly um, to the crisis because we could. You know, we are deeply connected. Um, a lot of our infrastructure is in the cloud. Ninety-five percent of our people can work from home, right? But going forward, um, you know, with the pressure testing of the economies across the world, uh, there is going to be a lot of need for reimagining and reinventing businesses. So I would say, um, other than uh, If we could look at the ease of doing business measures, that is, whether it's labor reforms, or policy certainty on the implementation, um, or physical infrastructure, that would help. And then beyond that, we have to focus on two areas for um, from an Indian government perspective. Um, the first would be uh, digital technologies because they are going to be essential. you know to overcome all the social economic challenges um but at the same point uh, drive sustainable growth i mean just one study um uh, an accenture study said that just ai and data for example uh, could unlock about 1 trillion uh, in the economy in the next 10 years so that's one example and the second area which is more mid term but not immediate but has to be focused on is really skilling um because You know, even before the crisis, there was about two billion dollars worth of economic value at stake in India because of the lack of skills. And now, with the crisis, which has impacted certain industries, but also creates new opportunities. For me, this is has to be top focus. Um, and for that, we need you know multi-stakeholder connectivity. Now, the government, to be fair, has. recognizes both these are important uh, legs of the puzzle and <laughs> has set aside money is doing a lot of consultation around it in doing multi sectoral partner, partnership but we need to get back together on that mm-hmm. i mean i mean you we we talk about a, a 
the, uh, I, I mentioned it to Ashish, this, this idea of a, a changing psychology that might be required among business. What, what about just, I mean, you mentioned the state, you mentioned the government. What, what, what about a, a reinvention of, of, of the state? Uh, this, this idea that it needs to stop micromanaging, that it needs to perhaps shed its commercial activities and, and, and shift focus a little bit in order for the sort of transformation that you need to happen. Very quickly, Rekha, on that. So I would agree. I would say that, uh, um, you know, uh, what's uh, our Prime Minister came into the role with, with a uh, slogan which said, uh, 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 max, uh, uh, maximum governance, minimum government, uh, and that would really help, uh, which means that, you know, the government minimizes the space that it doesn't need to be in, and there is a recognition of that. You see this few of changes that have got announced at this time, uh, in terms of the government getting out of some spaces, the disinvestment that's happening, but acting more as an enabler, um, that will be a big game changer. Uh, very good. Thank you very much, indeed, Rekha. Um, um, Sanjay, let me bring you in here. Um, India has clearly been hard on rework, uh, been working hard on on. on renewing its pitch, if you like, as a, as a rival manufacturer to China, as a rival manufacturing center. Can, can, the, can the pandemic, Sanjay, help in any way to, to sharpen that pitch? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the last part. Can the pandemic help in any way too? To sharpen that pitch, to, 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 to now really make the you know, I, I think uh, India has a huge opportunity uh, from this uh, pandemic uh, to make a large number of uh, changes. But I think uh, what people who want to invest in India are looking for is stability uh, more than anything else. Uh, they're looking for a stable uh, business environment. Uh, while the ease of business uh, ranking in India of India has improved, I think, by more than, uh, by close to 100 points. Uh, this data is from two cities. And, uh, you know, we've had a situation where uh, government has lowered the cost of doing business, for example. It has uh, given a 17% tax for in, uh, investment in manufacturing if production begins before October 2023. Uh, um, state governments have actually... Uh, you know, curtailed or suspended labor protection laws to try and sweeten the deal, so to speak. But quite often, investors get alarmed by suddenness and arbitrariness of some of these decisions. And I think what we need uh, to ensure is there is stability in our decision making, that there is long term stability so that people are uh, sure that they want to invest in this market. Because India is a huge market. India has a large middle class. India has a lot of raw materials that are needed for manufacturing, and uh, it would be a base from where to export from. How, how do we get that stability back, uh, Sanjay? How, and, uh, given the uncertainty right now, uh, given the uncertain times for business and, 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 and balance sheets, how do, how do we get the stability back? Well, you know, you have to make it predictable to do business in India. Uh, the highest priority for any investor, I believe, is to trust the referee, not to change the rules of the game. Midway. And as far as the pandemic is concerned, I think the whole world is going to have issues. I mean, uh, we still have a rising curve of infections uh, going on. And as a manufacturing company, I'm looking at, you know, how do I make my own supply chain as stable as possible going forward, you know, right from my vendors to my uh, and customers. So uh, I believe that uh, you have to make it predictable to do business in India. The rest of the world, as far as the pandemic is concerned, I believe is going to be in a similar situation. Okay, Sanjay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Nasa, let me let me come on to put an opening uh, question to you. Clearly, the country has been on a, a, a steady financial inclusion journey for, for many years. Um, how how big a plan did the pandemic throw into the work when we talk about financial inclusion? And what should financial uh, institutions be doing? What should the government be doing to ensure that, that the process stays on track now? Um, I think um, um, 
we were fairly down the road on financial inclusion. I think microfinance, and I work a lot in the NGO sector, uh, civil society institutions had done a lot um, uh, on the ground. Um, and I think the savings and credit societies at the grassroots levels have, have actually taken off in a huge way. Um, so I think that process was um, energized. Um, personally, I think the pandemic has put a huge spanner in that world. Uh, it's going to take uh, a lot of effort to revive, um, uh, revive that. Um, um, I think just the pressure of migrants coming back uh, uh, to their villages to uh, add to that burden uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, local societies had sort of managed well got ready to manage themselves. They have another uh, uh, another burden to bear. Uh, so I think um, that this is going to be a major issue. Uh, and I think institutions like the Bandhan Bank and all have a major role to play uh, as far as uh, this is concerned. Um, and I think the, even the commercial banks will have to look at uh, microfinance institutions, how they can help microfinance institutions on the ground more so than they have, because the, uh, the microfinance institutions went through a huge period of real distress uh, because of the way some had played the game. And so the banks withdrew uh, from supporting microfinance institutions. And I think that's a key institutional presence that's going to be required. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about the finance. Let, let's talk about some of the ambitious plans to to resuscitate small business. Um, it, it, you know, many would say this has got off to a, a pretty shaky start. Lenders say the demand isn't there. Businesses say that banks are cherry picking who they're prepared to lend to. Um, this, uh, uh, and, and in fact, NASA, let me start with you and then I'll come on to uh, you, Ashish. But th this is something that really needs to be sorted out straight away. Yeah, I think the uh, fiscally, I think the, uh, the government program of uh, uh, government guarantee on loans to MSMEs is a very powerful tool already working. Um, and I think a lot of NBFCs are uh, using it. Um, uh, and I think this this could could be a very positive uh, impact. I think the MSMEs are very severely impacted. When the big boys are in trouble, <laughs> the medium and small are also in trouble. Um, a lot of companies actually are supporting the, their own vendors and their own MSMEs in the process. So I think there is a support program going on to help uh, the key uh, suppliers of the supply chain uh, to the big boys. Mm. Um, but I think uh, 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 my big problem is I do not see demand emerging very quickly in the Indian economy. It's not going to happen. And I think we have to be uh, very, very careful as to how we uh, we we look at uh, the demand situation, don't forget that in March the index of industrial production was negative six. In March, this is before <laughs> the COVID crisis, so we were slowing down on the on the real side of the economy, very much so before COVID hit. Mm. The impact of COVID is going to accentuate that whole process. So I think we have to be very, very concerned. And I think for, and I, what I feel is the public and private investment will both fall short. Because today with excess capacities, who would invest? Uh, why would government, government has fiscal strain anyway. So how does the public invest, the public investment program start? So to my mind, the key, key solution is infrastructure. Perhaps we can come to that. Mm, okay, um, and there's quite a few comments and questions coming through on specifically on this. 
the private sector banks not being adequately supportive of medium-sized businesses. Someone uh, suggests, why can't we use the employee guarantee scheme um, uh, that we've seen uh, uh, used in the US and, and, and Germany? Um, what about uh, access to debt markets? Sanjay, let me ask you about this. And, and uh, um, um, Ashish, I'll get your opinion. And Rekha, I will bring you back in just a second. Access to debt markets. You know, uh, clearly, credit markets are, it seem to be drying up. There's a worry about uh, SMEs access to, uh, to debt. Uh, markets. What what can the government? What can regulators do to ease the debt funding for companies? This is clearly a critical point. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I I would prefer uh, one of the finance people to answer that because I I don't have much experience with debt markets. My company is not that uh, is uh, in a much better situation. But uh, you know, one of the things as a manufacturing company that we did was to make sure that despite the closure, we paid off all our medium, small, and micro industries who are our vendors. Because I think to begin, it's very important that uh, all manufacturing companies and all customers pay off their suppliers, just like we expect our customers to pay us. So uh, I, I would uh, actually hand over this question to one of the finance people. Yeah. Okay. Actually, let me let me ask let me ask you this. The 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 when I mean Frank Frank and Templeton shot six credit funds due to redemption pressure. I mean, the, clearly there's a squeeze going on here. No, uh, in a way, uh, if you see, uh, the government had to work under a lot of constraints. Uh, U.S. is in a different zone. Uh, what they print, other people buy, you know, in terms of uh, worthless paper in U.S. becomes very worthwhile for everyone else. So U.S. is in a different zone. Uh, U.K. has been providing uh, employment guarantee, uh, 80% 80 of the salary in people's accounts, but I don't know for how long. Because uh, what happened is, in the initial phase, uh, when the Chancellor of Exchequer announced, probably they had a perception that they'll be able to handle it in one or two months. Once the time passes, you will realize that UK uh, would be actually increasing the government debt by so much that it may not be sustainable. India is not in a very good position, as Nasser said, uh, in terms of fiscal uh, constraints that it has. And 2008-9 crisis, it was realized that India also uh, gave loans pretty much indiscriminately. And those loans then later on became the non-performing assets due to which the India has now the largest amount of uh, loans in moratorium. In a way, uh, we are in a Hobson's choice, you know, in a catch-22. If you do this, you are doomed. If you uh, do other thing, you are damned. So the uh, idea is to uh, basically do it in a such a way that it's constrained, but it provides uh, the targeted uh, sort of medicine. And in Jandar Andar Mobile, uh, India has a very targeted way to achieve uh, every individual uh, with, of course, the rationing shops uh, for food and money directly without any leakage. Mm. Doing it for SMEs, you have to actually decide which SME will be able to survive, which SME will be able to uh, thrive, and which SME will go down even if you put in money. So they had to figure this out, and the government does not have that type of data which they have for the Jandan Adar mobile, for the poor people in the country. They don't have for the SMEs. And it's not easy even for banks to figure out uh, which co company will survive and thrive. And that's where uh, the government couldn't directly put money into people's accounts or SMEs accounts. They had to go through the banks. What mm. they have done is interesting in India. I think I have not seen this happening anywhere. Uh, they have created a framework for providing equity to SMEs. And then if you have equities, then they have also given guarantees uh, to the banks for ensuring that the SMEs get uh, loans also. So they are giving equities, they are giving loans, uh, and that's where I've been told uh, already the loans have started uh, reaching out. Uh, probably uh, $10 billion, 8 to $10 billion have already been uh, sort of sent out uh, to the public, and uh, probably some more might go. But just to give you a perspective on the bond market itself, uh, in the uh, lockdown period, from March 23rd to June 7, uh, we raised uh, almost 3.27 lakh crore of funds. Out of which, you, if you take away the 50,000 crore, which is around $7 billion for the Reliance uh, rights issue, the rest, uh, almost uh, 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 2.7 lakh crores, uh, that is uh, almost $70 billion, we raised through either commercial papers or during the lockdown. Indian market did not stop. 
and uh, we also allowed small people like you mentioned about franklin templeton all the investors in the country have been able to sell their mutual funds as and when they want except for those six teams and get their money in case they require so we have been pretty much providing a financial system across india where people are able to put in money take out money at the prices at which they are available so in a way indian financial system worked really well uh, the government does not have the ability to pump in a new money because then trade, trading would have suffered okay uh, Okay, Ashish, thank you very much indeed. Um, by the way, I, I know it's we're supposed to stop at eight, but because we started late, we're going to go on a little bit longer. If that's okay with uh, with all of you, uh, and again, my apologies for that. Um, Rick, I want to bring you back in. A comments coming through on education and skilling and the change that is needed post the pandemic. You know, what what sort of thing do you think the country needs now? I mentioned self reliance, um, clearly to foster a culture of innovation. This should come from the grassroots, from the primary schools, from the colleges. What, what needs to be done? You know, when we look at the education system in, in India. Okay, so let me um, address this in a certain way. So one, uh, if we see um, during this time, um, there has been an increased focus on um, technology again. You know, online learning, right? Um, and there's been huge amounts of fabulous content that has come on, but but. the same access is not available um to all the children whether in government schools in rural areas tier 1 tier 2 mm. so the first thing i would say is we have to relook at our education system uh, and see what we can do to provide better access of the good content that's now coming up uh, into the rural areas we already have connectivity but there needs to be a multi stakeholder partnership to look at that second back to the skilling example because if you don't get that right um and don't work together then all the opportunities that are coming up not just for us as an industry technology but all the new industry op- options that are coming up whether it's in healthcare or microfinance or yeah. anywhere else we will stand to lose it all um and therefore the old models don't work we're going to have to throw those models out um and create new models of learning could it be modular could it be digitized i'm a big proponent of digital of course um could it borrow from the world Uh, could we export to the world because we have very very interesting new models right here so it does need a uh, back to multi stakeholder um, engagement whether it's the private sector or the government or the not for profits and the academia which is already happening i mean we are seeing examples of it but we just need to sort of deepen that I mean clear, clearly some of the issues that we have worried about over the past few years the digital divide and you you mentioned this and the and the, the 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 many of the divides that are created here with with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution and the technology that's being used but that's only going to get worse now before it gets better surely It's a valid concern but actually if you look at it technology is just a tool right and its impact bad or good is determined how we is determined by how we use it right and to me we've seen over and over the examples of technology being actually a very powerful instrument of driving positive impact and it depends on how it's used i mean i just take an example of an agriculture for india right where the right uh, combination of advanced technologies can help farmers increase rural output can help price realization um can provide diversification towards high value crops right so it's it's the concern about uh, sections not getting equal access is a valid concern mm-hmm. we have to figure out ways to overcome those access bar- barriers but technology on its own does not create the digital divide is what i would say Okay, um, Sanjay, I want to come back to you on on manufacturing, um, and 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 I know we've touched on this. Whether you feel the sector could be restored to its role as the creator of jobs uh, and economic stability, and clearly, jobs, as as she as she said, is 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 the critical yeah um, jobs growth. Um, can india become the manufacturing hub of southeast asia can the supply chains that we are currently in place be tweaked or dismantled um given that the current system uh, is is undergoing um such pressure at the moment given this is such a vulnerable time for companies i think uh, indian companies are very innovative and uh, you know if you can survive in india i think you can survive anywhere in the world 
with all the uncertainties that we have everywhere. And uh, my belief is that uh, this is actually a great opportunity for Indian manufacturing to gain revenues and be a larger part of the economy. You know, we've been trying to get it beyond 15% or 16% for some time. But I think uh, there is an opportunity to gain revenue from services because as uh, habits of social distancing and touchless consumption develop, I think the demand will shift to products that will be that can be installed or used or serviced via the Internet of Things. And digitization of products will allow us uh, to have a direct relationship with users by turning products into services. Uh, you know, many industrial customers may prefer to have digital twins of critical equipment with manufacturers for remote performance control and predictive maintenance. And I think this is where Indian manufacturing actually, I mean, it's a little off your question, but how does Indian manufacturing gain a higher percentage of revenues uh, in the GDP or achieve a higher percentage of GDP? So there is, you know, a window of opportunity for Indian manufacturing uh, for rapid induction of technology is what I think, because the lockdown has uh, highlighted the vulnerability of uh, production. Uh, even when factories reopen, uh, they are only open, reopened with partial staff. Uh, the more automated and connected factories, I think, have fared better. So India has to digitize and automate manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And I think when you go, when we talk about a self-reliant India or an Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, as the prime minister call it, I think we need to be open to the world. We need to be able to, if we want to export, we should be ready to import also. And I think we need to import technology in a very big way because, you know, if you are only talking about self-reliance, you end up with companies that are inefficient. Uh, but one point I would like to make as we go forward, because India should open up is my point of view. And I feel that we should allow 100% ownership also. But what I would like is to see that we insist in, in return for access to our markets, we insist on a high local value addition in India. So that, you know, not only will we get the latest technology if we allow 100%, but it will also allow upgradation of our people's skills. Mm -hmm. And that will also lead to design skills being developed in India. And, you know, once you develop that entire foundation, we will be able to uh, export in a big way. Okay. Um, uh, um, uh, NASA, may, uh, may, maybe this is still a question for Sanjay, but NASA, let me throw it to you. I and mean, we talk about manufacturing. Clearly the elephant in the room, as some of the uh, viewers are, uh, are saying, is the, is the, the China-Indian uh, manufacturing balance. How, how big a shift could we now see potentially in this in this balance, this China India balance when we talk about manufacturing, when we talk about supply chains? Well, I think uh, the, the there is an opportunity. Um, uh, uh, we will have to balance out. I mean, um, uh, the, the competitive nature of uh, Chinese imports may, may not now continue. Um, but I think for manufacturing, uh, post um, COVID or even now, there's a very anti-China focus globally. Um, we're going to see Apple moving out of China. The Japanese have moved out of China. Um, and now you're going to see um, any, the, 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 at least the international players will be looking for other homes. And the question is whether India can actually attract them or they're going to go to Vietnam or uh, Philippines or Indonesia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the question is, does our infrastructure actually a plug and play process really support uh, the new game? Uh, that is why I mentioned the absolute critical nature of infrastructure, because that will allow us to play an international game. Uh, if we don't have that infrastructure, um, and if we don't have simplification, we have to simplify things the way we do things. Um, if we don't, because most foreign investors always tell me that India is too complicated. We don't understand what's going on. We don't understand what you want. We don't even understand what the government is doing and what's going to be put on the ground. So if we can actually simplify, just tell us your story and we will play a part in that story. So very critical for India now is to build that story. 
what is that story that we want to build and how are we going to back that story? What are we going to do to back that story? So I think that is the, the clarity of thinking, um, the consistency of thinking, and the certainty of that thinking. Uh, the three C's, as I call it, very critical today because it has to break the barriers of what people think about us from abroad. Because mm -hmm. we're going to need a huge amount of foreign investment to make any any uh, any amend. You know, we need about two to three trillion dollars of investment in the next five years, uh, not a few billion. And people are throwing loose change at us. Uh, we can only do that if we actually create the story, we actually open up things, we actually invest and look at what are sequ the sequential investments that we need to make. And I'm suggesting, for example, that we must set up an infrastructure commission of the best minds we can find who can sequence these investments and actually give international investors a feeling that yes, we've got the best minds thinking through how we're going to sequence this. Mm -hmm. And in the post-COVID situation, we really need it because the infrastructure investment can be looked at the national, urban and rural level so that it can address the employment issues, the demand issues, that are facing us in the next two years. Yeah, okay. So we have to actually do that. Rick, no, 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 Rick, I, I want to bring you in on, on this. This, with this, as NASA was saying, this, this simplification, this clarity that's clearly so essential and that clearly needs to come from the top down and the bottom up. You know, every every way we can. What, what are your clients telling you on on the need for for, for a simpler, a, a, a clearer process? So I, uh, I was just going to first respond to Nath and say, if you see our industry, the technology industry is a, a clear example where um, uh, the, uh, the government did not intervene too much, left the people to their own devices, but yet created enabling mechanisms, strong enabling mechanisms. And that's how it is right now, a 190 billion industry employing over 4 million people is maybe that's a model to be looked at for a lot of the other uh, areas in India, right? Um, clients, I would say a couple of things. One, a lot of them right now are dealing with business resiliency. How do you keep your business on the ground? How do you grow? How do you make sure that your supply chain, which has got disrupted, um, is not, uh, you know, how do we get it back? But to the mid and long term, there's also a huge think about uh, what do I need to do um, to make sure that there's cost elasticity? What do I need to do to see that I'm not caught in this business continuity issue where I'm dependent on one geography, for example, and how do I make sure that? And the third one, of course, is a uh, 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 supply chain. How do I ensure, secure my supply chain for the future? But they're also starting to think a little beyond that and saying, this is an opportunity to reimagine my business, right? Because we've seen behavior changes of the type we've never seen before. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, panelists referred to that, right? And therefore, how much can I go digital? How do I reach new customers? Customer experiences change. So, so there's bucket one, which is business resilience. Bucket two is cost elasticity, supply chain, uh, and bucket three is reimagining businesses. Okay, very good. And look, I've got a wary eye on the time. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, though, and I do want to get a final comment from each of you. But a couple of things before I do that, and, and this is to some of the questions coming in. Sanjay, specifically to you, what sort of manufacturing should we seek to attract under Make in India, and which one should we avoid? Uh, you know, I, I would like uh, all kinds of manufacturing to come to India because that is what will create jobs, whether it is low tech or high tech. I would prefer high tech, so to speak, and uh, in areas that uh, are going to change the lives of Indians uh, more than anything else, because that's, you know, what, what we need, number one. And uh, like I said a little earlier, whatever we do, uh, we should see that through that, not only does technology come to India, high tech in any area that is possible, but how do we upgrade the skills of our people? Because that is what is most important for India, that people have jobs and people's skills are upgraded because there is a future. I mean, we are, we are talking about COVID-19 just now, but, you know, humanity will go on, hopefully will go on and on after this. So uh, we have to see how to prepare ourselves for this century and beyond. 
Okay. Uh, and and to to you, Ashish, um, you know, I know you you put this in the notes that that, uh, that that you sent to me beforehand. Can can India, you know, with a view to jobs can, and and with a view to uh, free trade zones, can can the country create those tre- free trade zones with f- fewer restrictions to to achieve the flexibility required to create the jobs that it so desperately needs? You're you're on mute. If you recall the entire panel discussion, it's about India wanting to, or in, if India does consistency, if it does entire planning of infrastructure, if it does execution well, if it does judicial reforms, administrative reforms, land reforms, labor reforms, India is 17% of world population. It's not Vietnam or it's not Sweden with uh, 10 million population, right? So it's a very large country to reform in one day or 10 years. If we want to really bring the jobs, we will have to create newer frameworks, which China did in 1979 onwards. They created a con- sort of a small little country within China called Shenzhen. They ensured that there is no part of China which goes and it troubles them, no part of bureaucracy. Only the laborer moves into that country in the morning, comes back in the evening. If we can do that, and we have good coastline compared to any other country, we, if we can create 200 uh, special economic zones where no bureaucrat goes in, People can basically move in and out their supply chain because you can't create the entire supply chain of anything uh, within one country today. You will have to have move in and move out where customs people cannot stop you and so on and so forth. And that becomes a separate kind of a country where no labor laws, no land laws, no uh, sort of other laws apply except probably environmental law. And there it will create huge amount of jobs. It's not that in one uh, SEZ you will be able to create all of that. So if you have 100 of them, whichever succeeds, you copy paste that into other areas. And some of them will fail. But earlier, we tried SEZ and they became basically real estate game. Here, if you allow them, say, 20 years, we are not going to change anything in this. Except that the laborers who get jobs will have to pay income tax, which is fine. They will also be paying other uh, consumption taxes like GST and all. But within that, nothing, no taxes, no nothing. And then when the material comes into India for Indian consumption, that is the time you may be able to do it. The other part of the labor skills, I recall in 1994-95, we had only probably 500 engineers in computer science coming up. As soon as jobs started coming up, people started learning and doing it. Indians are truly amazing at learning newer things, newer skills, newer everything. If jobs come, they will learn. But if you say, no, first we will prepare them and then get them jobs, those jobs are not coming. People are getting frustrated. Idea is to first get the jobs they will do i'm telling you indians will work very hard but we need to also give other people coming in to do business saying 20 years 30 years this is the framework we are not going to come in and trouble you uh, which is currently happening in all parts of india and that's what if you want to really do it the last part which i wanted to say is today again is a, a kind of a geopolitical break that is happening and for me geopolitics eats economics for breakfast if you can align with the right people, then the economics also will uh, work out, provided we also uh, change ourselves, if not fully, on the SEZ side. And who knows, we might have a huge amount of manufacturing jobs coming. But where we are good at, that is IT and pharmaceuticals, which are very high value added stuff. If we have target to go from 200 billion in IT, BPO, to $1 trillion in next 10 years, mm-hmm. it's doable because we have skills, we have ecosystem, we have exposure. Similarly, yeah. in pharmaceuticals and so on. And so forth. That's basically uh, the framework which I come from. I, you know, with a journalist hat on, uh, Ashish, uh, uh, geopolitics eating uh, economics uh, for breakfast is a, a fantastic quote uh, that I'm going to remember on the back of this. Look, there's one question that's come in, which is which is addressing the points that you, Sanjay, and Ashish make. I'm going to refer to this, and then and then I'm going to ask her some closing uh, thoughts from all of you. But the the point to you, Sanjay and Ashish. Uh, uh, from from um, the, the chief executive of a company uh, in the country, respectfully disagree. Um, um, the puck is moving. Sorry, forgive me here. The puck is moving elsewhere. Don't you see the real opportunity to seize global leadership in manufacturing is to have a massive investment agenda to leapfrog to the fourth industrial revolution, and then those jobs comes the question, Sanjay.
You're, you're on mute, mute Sanjay. <laughs> Sorry. So that's why I did say that there's a huge opportunity for Indian manufacturing to gain revenues from services. And we should get all kinds of technology that is possible. And I mean, it could be the fourth industry for whatever is needed for the fourth industrial revolution. But you need all kinds of products every day uh, to be used. And uh, my point is, you know, uh, we need to ensure that we get the support and the encouragement not only to make in India, but to manufacture overseas. Because unless Indian tier two and tier three companies get into uh, global supply chains, we will not be able to absorb the best technology. So the most open economies make the fiercest competitors. And I'd like to see India over there. OK, very quick comment on that, that question from you, Ashish, and then I'm going to get some closing remarks. For me, uh, the fourth industrial revolution is what I call uh, a place where India can actually excel. Last thousand years, India was capital stout. And also, uh, because there was no capital, we did not create uh, sort of situations where we could manufacture. Uh, today, first time in the history of mankind, uh, and especially last thousand years, that you can create huge amount of wealth without putting too much capital. And every Indian, in a way, has an exposure uh, to newer activities like mobile phones, uh, like uh, soft, uh, software, drones, uh, robotics, and many other things. And for me, if India, with its 17% of world population, 22% of young people of the world, if it can create 25% of the world's wealth in next 50 years, which is going to create almost more wealth in next 50 years than it has created in the last 10,000 years, India is going to reach from $9 trillion of wealth to almost $100 trillion of wealth in next 50 years. And that's where, for me, uh, an opportunity for Indians, which basically which missed out the entire industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And the fourth industrial revolution, for me, is where India is ready. It is independent. It is young people who will be able to uh, do newer things, who also have exposure to newer activities, which are actually backbone of the fourth industrial revolution. So this is actually an apt question that should India look back at the past and get the uh, manufacturing, which is very manual, or should India look in the sort of look forward, anticipate the industries and get them together. But for me, uh, you don't know what are the possibilities in the future. So you mm. need to continue to work with the past, but always whenever an opportunity comes for the future, we must take. And today I have no doubt in my mind that more and more uh, fourth industrial revolution, what I call dematerialized activity happens. Indians uh, will be at the forefront of it because this is a young population and it's going to learn newer things, create newer things. And if you can do that 25% of world GDP or world wealth, mm -hmm. uh, for next 50 years, we are going to be in somewhere middle range economies going forward. OK, look, um, th thank you, uh, Ashish, um, for those thoughts. I'm going to um, get some some closing um, uh, thoughts from from all of you, if I could. And Rekha, I want to start with you. And we talked about the fourth industrial Re revolution. Clearly, digital and digitization is 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 very much uh, uh, a part of uh, where, where you are looking. Um, you all sound optimistic you know it seems to me we all you all know what needs to be done what what should be done um the, the question is how how quickly will it be done will, will 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 you take this opportunity with this window of opportunity uh, in front of you um to 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 to, to speed things up Rekha, let me let me start with you Okay, so first, let me thank all the panelists to talk about the uh, fourth industrial revolution. I absolutely agree. I mean, which is the whole digital agenda, because we are seeing 10 years worth of digital journeys being done in six months. So if you don't get it right now, this is the opportunity. I want to not talk about actually answer your question in a different way, which is not uh, how quickly will it get done, but the how that as we move forward on all of this, we need to make sure we've realized fairly clearly that this is an interconnected world. And we need to make sure that all segments of the society are rising because otherwise we'll have other unintended consequences. And therefore, um, it's the bottom of the pyramid that we need to look at from our policy perspective, from, uh, uh, from uh, addressing their needs perspective and saying, how do we bring them up? And how do we do it as we stay sustainably and meet our sustainable goals? Mm. Okay. So thank you. Different all together on a broader yeah. note. 
No, 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 absolutely. And actually, just on, on the on the back of that, I, I, and I wanted to ask you this anyway. I wonder um, whether the, 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 the pandemic disrupts companies such as Accenture and pushes companies like yours to automate more and even use AI even internally. So we were already uh, a digital company. I mean, we are a digital company, and we're a good example of that. Uh, and we continue to uh, reinvent ourselves, and definitely we use AI internally. Absolutely. Is there less of a need to hire tens of thousands of workers every year? It does. It does. Automation does do that. It just creates very different kinds of skills and very different kind of jobs, which was back to my point saying we're going to have to invest in skills. So, mm. yes, it does. Mm. Okay, thank you, Rekha. Uh, Nasa, uh, some closing thoughts from you. Again, there seems to be this, this optimism. Um, we, we, I get a sense from all of you that we, we there are steps, whether it's simplification, verification, that you will no need to be achieved. Um, can it happen? Um, you know, Einstein many years ago said to uh, expect change by doing the same things the definition of madness. So I think we we need to take that on board. We cannot continue with our institutions, with our governance, uh, with the way we do things anymore. We have to raise questions. We have to change the way we do it. This is what's been happening over 70 years. Maybe COVID will change the way we, f- we function. And I think this is critical for everything we've said, um, is that we have to be able to completely change the platform of governance um, and uh, engagement between public, private, within the public sector itself, and the way we operate. Um, And I think that conversation is the key to our future. Because if you ask for your, if, if I ask the question, is India fit for future? I think there's a question mark. Uh, th- we are in certain ways. We are, in fact, we are, our potential and capability is way beyond you know, what we can imagine. But what is holding us back is this conversation of how we do things. So I think it's the governance, the frameworks and institutions. Yeah. We have to relook at them. Okay, Nasa, thank you for that. Um, and very quickly from Sanjay and, and Ashish. Sanjay, is Indian manufacturing, to use the f- phrase from, from Nasa, fit for future? You know, uh, you asked us about how why we are so optimistic. I said the thought that came to my mind was, is, is there any choice? You have no choice to be but to be optimistic. But, you know, there are so many new technologies that, has, that have come up, and that really shows human ingenuity, you know. When you have a problem, uh, how do you, uh, you have like 15, 20 solutions. And uh, we only hope that we choose the right one and are successful. Otherwise, it's like, you know, uh, making the bank broke as far as we are concerned, because some of them cost a lot. But I run a 130-year-old company, and we have uh, AR and VR, augmented reality, virtual reality for training. We have 3D printers used for production. And in this last three months, the best thing that I have seen is some technology that we developed to control our pumps uh, far away uh, through the Internet of Things. And there's so much uh, interest in a product like that and that, in, that too in India, which wasn't there three months ago. So that is what makes me optimistic about the future. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. And Ashisha, a, a, a final comment from you. On your optimism, you know, we haven't talked about this, the equity markets because I know that, uh, that um, Indian markets have lagged their emerging market peers in, 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 in the recovery from, from sort of lows inflicted by the pandemic. I'm not saying you have to mention anything about the equity markets now, but how optimistic do you feel generally? Yeah, I, I would uh, add to what Sanjay said. We are one 45-year-old uh, exchange uh, and we are the fastest exchange in the world with response time of six microseconds. In one second, there are a million microseconds. And why it is in India? Uh, although I can always take uh, the glasses half empty, but I would rather say glasses full and probably half full and it will become more fuller. Because uh, although uh, we can always say that we have been doing the same thing again and again, no. In fact, uh, when Rajiv Gandhi said that 100 rupees when he gives out uh, for uh, subsidy, only 15 paisa, that is 15% rich is poor. Now when you give 100 rupees, it goes 100 rupees. Because that's what we have done to our governance. Our, uh, but it doesn't happen in 17% of world population. 
in one instant it's not a dictatorship it's a democracy it's a what i call a society in continual negotiation the tremendous amount of noise and very very few signals but it because it's so, uh, so democratic it also has people who uh, keep on creating uh, challenges for themselves businesses for themselves and mm-hmm. actually instead of top down what i call chinese model is a top down model ours is a bottom up model and for me the bottom up model uh, is going to be the future of the world because uh, you don't require huge amount of money to be put in to create huge amount of wealth in future mm-hmm. you require little bit of money lot of brains which is what indians have and then you may be able to create huge wealth and that's for me uh, why i am so optimistic that today india is fully ready uh, of course we will have few illiterates but which country has literates but looking like illiterates you can see wherever all those agitations are going on right and so we have done in fact people were worried about india's ability to manage covid crisis 70 days of a uh, full lockdown not even china did that for the entire country and still no riots for food how did it happen automatically no government systems work we may break them all the time but the money reach people's pockets in the remotest part using the mobile can you believe it that india did it similarly yesterday my brother in us sent me a message asking sin uh, is uh, flavery par uh, which is a new medicine coming from japan russian collaboration is being manufactured in india and being sold at 100 rupees per tablet today there is another news of remdesivir being manufactured in india why i am telling you this is we may be uh, we may decide to be very pessimistic but large part of india is very uh, optimistic and it will continue to be in that direction all right very very good well look look the, the proof of course is in the pudding and i would love to i would suggest the five of us uh, do another session like this you know six months maybe maybe a little bit further out from now uh, and we can revisit uh, a lot of these uh, these uh, optimistic projections uh, i would love to do that uh, uh, from an editorial perspective more than anything else so look i want to thank uh, all of you um ashish sanjay rekha and nasa for a, for a really engaging uh, discussion my apologies again uh, that uh, we started a little bit late but we actually managed to make up even more time um on the back of that so thank you very much uh, to all of you and from me at uh, waiters uh, thanks very much to all our viewers for uh, for watching thanks very much thank you, thank you very much Thank you. Thank you.